Hey there. If you're watching this live, then you're what I like to call fashionably early, or more like fashionably on time. So thank you for being here. If you're not watching this live, feel free to skip a minute or so ahead. But if you're here, take this opportunity to slow down, maybe go brush your teeth, get a glass of water, say hi to everyone in the comments, or I could stop talking and let you enjoy some jazz. You still here? Good. I'm just checking. Before we begin, remember to keep it civil in the comments. Don't say anything you wouldn't want said to you. Thank you for being here, and enjoy the stream. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Apasit al -Iddin. If you're a regular on this channel, you would know that a lot of my streams in this series range in duration between an hour and three hours long. And that is not really intentional. It's just that some of these topics, when I watch a video and I want to comment on it, it either comes with a couple more videos that are relevant as well, or that the lecture itself is very long. Um, and on top of that, I have to cite some references at the end and things that I came across when doing a, a quick prep for the video. But in this case, I just stumbled upon this short video by Shabir Ali again, and you have the uh, the YouTube algorithm and the autoplay feature to thank for that. I think I was um, either preparing some links for the previous stream or after I was done, I was putting them in the description or so, and I just uh, came across this video. And though the magnitude of this topic should take up a lot of time, it's the approach to the answer that, uh, or the approach to the question that doesn't really justify too much time given to this topic, and, and you'll see what I mean. So today's lecture is about, is Islam the truth? I don't know if I'd call it a lecture or this, this talk, this interview is about, is Islam the truth? So I wonder how they're going to approach the topic, because usually it's a, it's a difficult question to answer, because the people trying to answer it already believe Islam is the truth. So I suppose the better angle to come up come at this from is how do you prove to someone who doesn't believe that Islam is the truth that it is the truth and it's not about being adversarial or about being pedantic this is actually a good question and it's something that I asked myself as I was uh, trying to, to to keep my faith how would I or how would somebody explain Islam to an outsider and would that method apply to me would it work for me so without further ado let's get to the video Please tell me if the um, audio volumes aren't matching or something. You're watching Let the Quran Speak. Why should someone seriously consider Islam? And if someone is setting out to find the truth, how would they know Islam is it? We asked Brother Shabir Ali. Brother Shabir Ali, um, for Muslims, this is a kind of a hard question to answer because we, 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 we grow up thinking Islam is the truth, but we don't really interrogate our beliefs. We don't... I really appreciate that candidness. And I want to remind people... The reason I take apart these uh, these talks is not because I don't like. It's not necessarily because I dislike the person or because I, I think everything they say is wrong. But it is there's just a bit of scrutiny that has to be given there. And when they're right, they're right. I think that is a very good question and a, a good angle to come at it from. She recognizes that as a believer, you already believe. 
don't really continue. We, we, we grow up thinking Islam is the truth, but we don't really interrogate our beliefs. We don't really continuously ask the question, why is Islam the truth? So sometimes we can forget uh, the reasons why we believe in Islam. So maybe you can help us to answer that. Wait one second. She, she kind of backpedaled a bit, not intentionally. She said, so sometimes we forget the reasons why we believe. But she had just mentioned that they already believe. I, I don't think Muslims or believers in general believe because of reasons that they're going to outline now. The, the point was that they already believe in it. And she was aware of that. That question. Why yes. do you believe Islam is the truth? Mm -hmm. Well, several reasons. One is that the idea of God in Islam is very simple, and, and this is a kind of universal idea. All of the great uh, arguments for the existence of God that survive from classical times point to the existence of one God, and that's what Muslims believe. So Sorry, I'm going to have to slow it down a little bit. So he said there's several reasons, and in my opinion, one on its own should be enough. I don't think that that's how proof works, but I'll grant it. Maybe that is the case. And first, he's talking about the simplicity of the idea of one God, I believe. I don't want to put words in his mouth, so let's go back for a second. Kind of universal idea. All of it. Why yes. do you believe Islam is the truth? Mm -hmm. Well, several reasons. One is that the idea of God in Islam is very simple. And yeah, so he said it because it is a simple idea of one God rather than the complexity of uh, polytheism or a lot of other ideas. And, and this is a kind of universal idea. All of the great uh, arguments for the existence of God that survive from classical times point to the existence of one God, and that's what Muslims believe. So it's a very firm foundation. Uh, second, the idea of... So that first one doesn't prove Islam, but I suppose he's trying to build a case for Islam. So first of all, he's, um, quote, unquote, proving that there is one God. And obviously, he's not going to go into details, but what he's citing is philosophical arguments about whether there is a God at all or not. And if there is a God, it would make sense that it is the most powerful, the most supreme, so therefore it is only one, and so on. But I have to remind you that philosophers disagree, including reasonable people. And uh, I, had, uh, I had saw a discussion in the comments earlier that was talking about, rightfully, most philosophers in the world now are atheists. Uh, and that's not on its own. That's not really proof of anything. But if you go back far enough, if you go to, um, you know, a, a Muslim land, most philosophers would have been Muslim. So that would kind of prove that people are biased to believe what they're born into. And also at the same time, proving that reasonable people can disagree about this fundamental thing. So we'll, we'll get back to the rest of the uh, the talk now. Monotheism was emphasis very firm foundation. Uh, second, the idea of monotheism was emphasized in Judaism. There's been a series of prophets uh, whose uh, lives and teachings are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible uh, over many uh, hundreds or thousands of years. Here's the thing. All those prophets or a lot of these prophets, there's no actual proof that they existed, let alone that what they said is from God. So once you go... You know, once you keep building on, on stories of prophets, on stories of prophets, you're obscuring the standards for what constitutes proof. Just because you took so many non-proof stories doesn't mean that you have one proving story. And the Quran, for example, or Islam, borrowing from these stories and sometimes inaccurately doesn't mean that it also came from the same source. Muhammad existed around people who were saying the same stories. And sometimes it would seem like he misheard the stories or, as the apologists would put it, the other religion is now corrupt conveniently and what we have is actually the true version of it. So that's not really proof. And uh, uh, th these all emphasize the teaching of one God, and that is what is again mentioned in the Quran. Uh, so, so sort of a historical progression then where Islam is the end. Yes, and, and this is how Muslims see the religion of Islam as a culmination of the teachings of the great prophet. So if we have religions uh, spawning from the teachings of uh, important prophets and heroes, personages from all around the world, uh, Muslims see that... The it's not really all around the world, is it? I mean, we have stories from other religions that either they're legends that were adapted into those Abrahamic religions or claims that there were prophets in other parts of the world, but not really naming where, or how the Islam claims that every people will be sent a messenger. 
what does that really mean? We, we don't really know. So claiming something is not really proof that there were so many prophets. And it's still obscuring the point. Where is the actual solid proof that you would give to uh, someone who doesn't believe? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is uh, a part of this family of prophets and that his message is a culmination of the messages that God has been delivering to prophets of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that in essence, the message is the same. And uh, in terms of application, the specific uh, instruction given to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, is, is now what is most uh, pertinent to our present time and circumstance. One second. If you watched some of these videos that I made with specifically Shabir Ali on this channel, which is Let the Quran Speak, he has a recurring theme of saying that a lot of these so-called classical interpretations and so on are outdated and they were for their time. And now he's saying this is adapted for our time, when that is absolutely not true. And the times of Prophet Muhammad compared to the times of the previous alleged prophets are closer in terms of technology and societal values and, and the way that they, they lived their life, they're closer together than we are to Muhammad. So it would make more sense to send updates now. So he's, he's incorrect there. He's, he's contradicting himself. So mm -hmm. that we believe in all of the prophets in principle, but we follow the last of all of the prophets in practice. Mm -hmm. So and, you, and you mentioned the message. How do we know that this message is actually from God? Thank you. She's bringing it back on point. Well, we can examine the, uh, the written message itself, the Quran, which was left by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said that this was given to him as a revelation from God. And if one didn't believe that, one would think that, okay, it must be from he himself. He must have composed this on his own. So False dichotomy right there. So he's saying Muhammad claimed the, the message was from God or the Quran is what he means. The Quran is from God. And if that's not true, it must have meant that Muhammad alone wrote this Qur'an. And now he's going to talk about that. It's kind of a straw man because there's other possibilities too. So we already know that there are variants with some differences of, of the Qur'an copies. And that's what survived after the destruction of a bunch of other copies. We don't know how different those other variants could have been, like how many surahs were taken out. And there's hadiths, so sahih hadiths about some surahs missing and, and some verses missing and so on. So all that is to say the Quran was collected 70 years after Muhammad's, pro, uh, Muhammad's death. So it, it could have been just like the hadith that people have infused a lot of things into it. Or it could have been that he's actually, you know, talented linguistically in terms of a, a poetic sense without actually knowing how to read or write. And also there's a hadith about him wanting to write something before uh, on his deathbed, uh, write a guidebook for us so we don't get lost, which is bizarre because I thought that was the Quran and also it means he can write. So the, it, it's a false dichotomy to only put it as either Muhammad made up the whole thing and now let's see if that's possible or it's from God. There's a lot of other options in between. And the truth is we don't have records of what was going on around the time except Muslim records and even those sometimes contradict the, the, the standard narrative, as they say. So I'm not sure what he's falling back on here. So it's either with a message from God or from the Prophet Muhammad himself as a writer. But it couldn't be from the Prophet Muhammad himself as a writer for several reasons. One is that he is known in history to have been an unlettered person. He wasn't trained to read. He's known in history to be an unlettered person. What is in history exactly? He's known in Muslim sources, right, to be someone who can't read or write, according to Muslim sources. I mean, some Muslim sources, because like I said, when you get to some hadiths, he was able to, like, it doesn't explicitly say that he was able to write, but he asked for a pen and paper. So what does that mean? So you cannot use sources from the same religion to say that uh, according to historical records, you have to say according to Islamic historical records because that's not verified by an outside source. Read or write. And Muslims now would be uh, amazed at the Quran being the first Arabic textbook and uh, being in, in a very, in a very uh, literary uh, high level. Uh, what does literary high level mean? So because we're never able to quantify this kind of thing, it's um, like, let me give you... Well, not really a specific example, but 
there are instances, and I, I didn't look them up at the moment, but there are instances where the um, uh, there will be, aside from the differences between the versions of the Quran, there will be something that's grammatically not the way that Arabic is, but it becomes a rule in Arabic because that is now the standard of Arabic, even though it goes against the usual rules. And they make an exception for it. So it's it's um, it's circular to say that it's grammatically excellent or linguistically excellent. And that's also a distraction from the fact that people can write good books and that the standard of good is extremely subjective. And in many ways, the Quran is not really a good book. So this does not seem to come from the writing skill of an unlettered person. It uh, ties in with the belief that it's a revelation from God. Uh, second, we can point to the Prophet's sincerity that if, if he was writing this book on his own, trying to convince people that this is from God, then uh, why, why would he do that? He would be insincere and, and he should uh, not suffer the kinds of persecutions and so on that he did. Uh, so... Again, this is all in, in the direction of a straw man, which is how could he have written it himself? Let me remind you that that is a false dichotomy, but also that uh, if, if you had proof, absolute proof, you wouldn't need to bring up many weak points, many points that can't stand on their own. So if you take that point on its own, that doesn't really prove anything. And what he's saying is, why would he go through the trouble of writing it and facing persecution because of it? Why wouldn't he just give up if, if it was fake? How many con men, not to say that the whole Quran is a big con and stuff, I'm, I'm not making that big of an assertion in this video, but think about it. How many con men have suffered through so many of their cons and doubled down and eventually they, they got something out of it or they didn't? That's Again, that's not really empirical proof of, proof of anything. Uh, for the sake of this message, you should give it up easily if people did not want to believe in it. But so it's not fake because he was persistent? I mean, by that logic, there are ex-Muslims who've been around for longer than, than the Prophet's uh, whole uh, life as a Prophet. And if, if I keep doing this for a while or something, is that, is that really going to prove to anyone? I mean, given the amount of hate that I receive, does that prove that I'm sincere? Yes, it could prove that I'm sincere. And I could believe that Muhammad was sincere in believing that he is a prophet, perhaps. But does it prove that he speaks to God? No, it doesn't. Just like, does my sincerity prove that I am uh, that 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 Islam is not the truth? No, my sincerity alone does not prove that. So, again, he's not really using any proof here. But uh, historians of religion point to the fact that the Prophet maintained his teaching over 23 years, despite all kinds of persecution that was heaped upon him and his early followers and friends and family. And that shows its sincerity. When he said that it came from God, it, he really believed that himself. So he wasn't making it up and trying to fool people. Again, we can't verify whether he was really sincere or not, because just being persistent against hate doesn't prove sincerity. But even if he were sincere, that still doesn't prove that he was, you know, a messenger from God. That is our second point. The third point is that the Quran itself commands the Prophet, teaches him, it tells him what to do, and on occasion even criticizes him. On occasion criticizes him. So that happens very, very rarely. And one of those times is Abbas uh, Tawalla and Ja'ul Ahma, when the Quran says uh, he... Uh, he kind of frowned and, and, and looked away or ignored when a blind man came to him. And I believe the context was Muhammad was busy with uh, political leaders or, or leaders of tribes. And he dismissed a blind man uh, because, you know, he's just some poor guy and he doesn't have time for him at the moment. And the Quran was like, hey, don't don't do that. that that's, that's it. If he were writing the book on his own, then it would be like the, he is speaking to himself and criticizing himself as if he's schizophrenic or something. But that's an interesting point. Uh, there's a series by Abdullah Gondal on uh, Friendly Ex Muslims channel, Abdullah Salmiya's channel. It's called The Epileptic Prophet. I haven't finished watching it, but there is a lot of historical evidence, as he likes to put it, from Muslim sources pointing to a lot of signs of. Uh, either neurological conditions or mental health conditions that, you know, according to the admission of his own companions, they didn't diagnose it as a mental health issue but or a neurological issue, but they would describe the symptoms in detail. And 
you could make some inferences. But the point is, him saying he's probably not schizophrenic doesn't really prove anything. And also saying he's reprimanding himself very softly, or even if not softly in his in this book, doesn't make sense. But is that really proof of anything? Again, can a con man not m do something like that? Very, very plausible. And here it's not about plausibility only. We want proof. We don't want, is it likely that he made up the book or is it not? The Prophet, peace be upon him, is known to be a very sane person, a wise general. Known to be a very sane and wise general by who? By Islamic sources. Uh, a, a very uh, capable administrator. He has gone down in history as one of the wisdom sages of old, even by people who do not recognize him to be a prophet of God. Again, according to Islamic sources, we keep hearing he was a Sadiq al-Amin, the honest and uh, trustworthy man. Uh, allegedly, even his enemies allegedly said that. And I've mentioned this before. When you look at the stories in the Quran and Hadith from a uh, an exaggerated point of view, there you see a lot of these themes of exaggeration, either in description, either in the way that they describe distances or time or what they would do or violence or uh, or happiness. And the same thing, but by by saying his even his enemies thought he was a Sadiq al Amin, what proof is there except Islamic sources claiming that? And on the other hand, there was a case of a verse that was revealed to uh, to exonerate him because he was accused of stealing. I believe it was silk or a piece of cloth or something from um, from the the war booty, the 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 things that they received in in war that they took from the other group, uh, the other side that they were fighting, and God had to reveal a verse to defend him. Why would people even? I mean, people could accuse him, and some people here and there could accuse him. But if his reputation was that good, the accusation would never take off, and he wouldn't need God to interfere over something so silly. So, which one is it? So, he could not uh, have written the Quran on his own, it would seem to Muslims. Fourth, the Quran speaks about past history, and independent studies show that what the Quran detailed about previous prophets and, and, and details of history are actually true. Five, the Quran speaks... Okay, okay, we're, we're rushing a little bit. So, to remind you again, he's arguing that the prophet couldn't have written it by its own, which is not really the point here at all, uh, because it could have happened that he didn't write it on his own or he or it wasn't the way that it is till after his death nobody knows that for certain again we're looking for certainties for proof here and uh music guy thank you very much for the super chat he's one of my moderators here so give him a round of applause as always thank you and he mentioned another point that he glossed over that the quran mentions things historical things and independent studies have shown which he hasn't cited but have shown that they're accurate and <laughs> and how does that prove that that that's a divine book and the fact is there are inaccuracies i mean there are so many ways that the quran disagrees with the previous books especially when it comes to the bible for example but or or the or the torah and then Muslims are going to say, but that's because the previous sources are corrupted. You see how now there is absolutely no proof of anything. And again, none of this is proof. The fact that you had copied historical or relayed historical information semi-accurately or even very accurately, that's not proof of anything. The Quran speaks about past history and independent studies show that what the Quran detailed about previous prophets and, and, and details of history are actually true. Five, the Quran speaks about uh, the future and uh, other studies show that when the Quran speaks about what will happen in the future, uh, the, the Quran is right. And since only... Oh, okay, the Quran speaks about the future, so prophecies, I suppose, and other studies show, no citation, but studies show that the, when the Quran speaks about the future, it is right. Well, how about we use the Qur'an as um, the prophecies in the Qur'an? How about we use them to our advantage as a civilization, as, as an ummah? Why isn't the ummah pulling ahead using this so-called knowledge that was hidden in there that is about the future? Well, that's because if there is anything, it's just vague statements, just like the many prophecies in the hadith, like people are going to build taller buildings. Okay, people are already doing that. Uh, there's going to be corruption spreading. When the reality is actually corruption is a lot 
less than it used to be and peace is spreading, even though we're more aware of a lot of the non-peaceful things and violent things that happen every day, on average, at least globally, peace is, uh, you know, peace is higher. So all of these predictions, either they're very, very vague or they're kind of a hit or miss or they're going to happen eventually, maybe, maybe not. That doesn't prove anything. Only God knows the future. The Quran for Muslims, obviously, is the word of only God knows the future. To be a good to be good at predicting vague things, you don't need to be a God. And especially when you have the benefit of the doubt, which is if you don't get something right, it's because you didn't get it right yet. That's what Muslims would say. Eventually that might come true. Or it, it come true, it came true in a way that we don't understand yet, and we're gonna figure it out eventually, which is it's I believe it's called post hoc rationalization. You already have uh, like once something happens, then you start rationalizing it. And then you say, well, it fits this verse and that verse. Of God. Uh, uh, six. Uh, the Six reasons so far, or five that we've spoken about. If you have five solid reasons, that, that's all you need, right? I mean, I, I don't know. The Quran describes certain aspects of uh, physical phenomena that we can observe to call our attention to the greatness of God and his majesty. But at the same Notice this, the Qur'an describes physical phenomena that we can observe. We can observe already. At the same time, the language which is used in the Qur'an to describe these things, while being simple and understandable to the 7th century Arab, at the same time, from our modern perspectives, uh, seem to the, these expressions seem to uh, convey or, or, or betray the knowledge of the author. Seem to, seem to, keep that in mind, seem to convey or betray the knowledge of the author. Of some of the things that we're now discovering. So for most... Some of the things that we're now discovering. So what he means to say in simple terms is now we're reading certain verses and we're seeing patterns and saying, oh, this can apply to... Funny enough, someone's asking about this quant quantum entanglement or, uh, or quantum gravity and, and things like that. That's post hoc rationalization. We see some vague verses and we say, see, God said... We f I flattened the earth, meaning it looks flat, but it's not actually flat because in another part, he says it looks like an egg, which is not true. That's a mistranslation. So even if that were true, that there were some vagueness there that could apply to now that they haven't discovered, let me ask it this way. Would that have been proof a thousand years ago? If you met a non-Muslim a thousand years ago, would you say there's scientific miracles in the Quran? No, you can't use that. So how is it proof now? Allah made it so that it would prove the Quran 1300 plus years later and prove in quotation marks. So, so can we dismiss that and take all the other points and go back in time and convince a non-Muslim, uh, a, a skeptic, a, a critical thinker a thousand years ago using the same other reasons? This is amazing. It would mean that author of some of the things that we're now discovering. So for Muslims, this is amazing. It would mean that uh, this could not have been Muhammad. For Muslims, it is amazing. That, that, is a, that is a great point right here. The language is betraying him already. He's saying Muslims find this amazing and awe-inspiring, and he's right because they already believe. For non-Muslims, this is not amazing and not convincing. I'm not authoring this because how would he know the kinds of things we're discovering now in science? It's how would he know? Has he described them? If, if Muslims had that much of an edge already, why haven't they uh, ruled the world with all these discoveries? Why haven't they made any discoveries that were derived from the Quran, not the other way around? Not after we find something out, they say, you see this verse, if you squint and you twist it, and it could apply to that, that that's not really science at all. And let me remind you of something that they keep touting and some of them actually take back if they're honest and they and they um they they look at it carefully enough something like the um what was it called the uh, embryology in the quran it's been touted as a miracle for you know a couple of decades now I, i'm not sure exactly when it came to, into the da'wah market but the idea is that how could they have known that the embryo developed in that way back then well there's so many answers to that first of all so many people have including muslims have come out and said yeah that's not really that's not the right order 
like I'm a doctor and that's not the right order and so on. And, and then that order is already borrowed from the Greeks who knew it a long time before the Muslims. And then now the apologetic point becomes how could they have spoken to the Greeks or, or something along those lines. So we keep shifting and shifting and something that is proof should not change. We should be able to use it at all times. So if we can dismiss one scientific miracle or another, that just means that it's, it's the shotgun approach. It's like, here, here's six reasons so far, seven reasons. Pick whatever works. That's not how proof works. This seems to be the mind of God that is unfolding before. It would mean that uh, this could not have been Muhammad authoring this, because how would he know the kinds of things we are discovering now in science? This seems to be the mind of God that is unfolding before. This seems to be the mind of God that is unfolding. I, I like that he's honest with the use of language, and I don't think he realizes the, the words that are coming out of his mouth because he's just speaking casually. But it, it does convey the truth here. All of this to him seems, none of, the, none of this is proof of anything. To him it seems that way, and he said, as Muslims it seems amazing, and so on. Before us in the Quranic text. And, and there could be more that we say about this, but all of these reasons combined and more uh, point in the same direction, that uh, this book is not a human work, this is a revelation. Point in the same direction, not prove. They point towards that this book is not a human, which is, again, I disagree with, but even according to his standards, they point to the direction that it's not a, a human uh, book given to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the Almighty God. Mm -hmm. but and also, how do, you, how do you describe all of this to, say, uh, a Muslim who doesn't speak Arabic as a first language? When you use these proof of, of this could mean this and that, they just take the translation that you give them. How do they trust that this is a correct translation? They have to trust a man. And that middleman, be it a sheikh, a scholar, a da'wah person, we always scapegoat, or Muslims always scapegoat that middleman. Whenever there's an interpretation, even if it's, a, as he calls it, a classical interpretation, a very common, well-accepted for generations and generations interpretation, some Muslims would come in and say, but that's imperfect, that's the mistake of the man who translated it. Then where is God's perfection's role in this? Even in Arabic, there's, there's uh, trying to understand the verse, there's a bunch of differences even in Arabic, so let alone another language. So how is this, uh, how is this really proof? What about if someone listens to your presentation and says, yes, that's all well and good, but then Thank uh, you. what about the fact that in the Quran, some of the aspects of the Quran oh, seem archaic. They don't seem to fit into the time in which we live. Does that call into question the truth of the Quran? Uh, perhaps what they're referring to or what you're referring to is uh, some people may object that uh, some of the regulations, for example, in the Quran may be more suited to what time passed than, mm -hmm. than the present time. Yes. Uh, we should say that this is not a proof that the Quran is not from God. This is only a proof that the Quran uh, has a message which is uh, uh, suitable to various times and places. And we not various times and places, to that time and place. See how earlier he said the message was for us and our time and place, and now he says various times and places. What he means is it's most suitable for then, but we can derive maybe, maybe derive something new from it. And in the previous lectures in this, um, this channel that's called Let the Quran Speak, he would either point to a hadith when it's convenient or say even though, uh, even though the, uh, the scholars take it to mean this way from the Quran, Scholars can sometimes dismiss it and say that it's metaphorical or dismiss it and say it's a suggestion rather than an order or a command. So where is he, where is he getting this, this from, the fact that it's from today or for today? We have to today? recognize within the Quran what is most suited to our time and how to apply the Quran in a way that is suited to our time. We recognize the historical situation in which the Quran first spoke. And uh, we see that the Quran may have given some regulations because of the time and place in which it was first addressing its message. But the Quran also has within itself the seeds of growth and progress. It he always cites that kind of vagueness. And like I've demonstrated in every lecture of his, he never, he always fails to show us where that seed is. He doesn't even point to a verse that says something. And then he says, we can build on this and then interpret that maybe 
It could mean today so and so. He just says we need to take another look at these things. We need to interpret them in a new historical context. And he doesn't explain what he means. It, it, it allows for Muslims to practice what is referred to as ijtihad, which is the effort at uh, learn, learning how to apply the Quran in new and changing dynamic circumstances. So that's not a proof that the Quran is not a word, the word from God. It, it is just a, a challenge for Muslims to apply the Quran properly in new situations. Mm -hmm. So I would agree with the part about that's not proof that the Quran is not from God, but we're still waiting on proof that the Quran is from God. What reason is most compelling to you as an individual, as, as a Muslim, question. Um, for being a Muslim? Great question. Well, one of the things that I find uh, very fascinating about the Quran, and I find this to be a very compelling reason for thinking that the Quran is the word of God, is that uh, th there are certain mathematical peculiarities about the Quran that, that uh, could not be just simply um, all by coincidence. And I could not believe that that's the point that convinces him because I've heard one of his lectures before years ago about this um, numerical miracles in the Quran or mathematical miracles. And unfortunately today we don't have the time or energy, honestly the energy to go through his lecture about that. He doesn't talk too much about it here, but I, I will talk a little bit about it when, when he's done. And this would point to the hand of God behind the re revelation of the Quranic text. Uh, as far as we can look back, we see that uh, the earliest Muslims just simply tried to uh, recollect the Quran as was taught to them by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and to record it in sheets and then eventually to produce the copies that we have now. And uh, one looking at that process would find that it's like almost ad hoc. People are just rushing about trying to do the best they can to collect all of the pieces so that nothing gets lost. But now we find that there is a deep mathematical structure in the Quran. And when we find this, we, we are finding here elements of design. And uh, that, that uh, goes back to the... That's an interesting point. So, uh, yes, Abdullah Sharif, thank you. Look up the birthday problem. I'll talk briefly about this in, in a little bit. Uh, what, what he's talking about here, he's saying there's a mathematical structure to the Quran, which, you know, there's a lot to be said there. But let's presume that there's some kind of hidden math in the Quran that points to a designer, he said. Okay, nobody said that the Quran popped up from thin air. Someone wrote it, or a bunch of people wrote it. So saying that there's a designer behind it doesn't mean that it's a divine designer. Just like how other books have, you know, this this is not really a supernatural thing. This is not something that humans cannot achieve. The things that we have achieved today the things that we, the, the fact that I'm able to watch this lecture that he had, had um, or this discussion that he had, I don't know how many years ago, and talk to you guys almost instantaneously is a miracle. The things that we have achieved using our, our observation of, of the universe and then applying that are way, way more impressive than anything we've ever deduced and applied from the Quran or any other holy book. Not that it necessarily has to be about scientific progress. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you're impressed by how how complicated something is, how sophisticated something is, look at the design of the thing that you're watching me on. Is that more complex? Can, can you make that? No, you can't. Therefore, it must be from God. If you gave enough authors enough time or even the same author enough time, they would come up with something uh, and, and many have, have come up with a lot more impressive books than a string of things put together that if you, if you already believe, you'll find miraculous in these bizarre ways that aren't really miracles. So if he is correct about it pointing to that being intentional, which is a big if, then that still doesn't prove that the designer is divine in any way. Are you saying humans aren't smart enough to do some math and some word trickery? Because they're smart enough to make the smartphone that you're watching this on. So the wider argument, if, if we see evidence of design in the universe, that calls for a designer uh, who we say is God. And that's a which is a whole other topic. But that whole thing, even if you follow through this kind of argument, uh, the designer, the creator argument, you arrive at the idea that there there must be something that started this or created this. It doesn't say that it's uh, it doesn't necessi necessitate that it's one God. And it certainly doesn't help you arrive at Islam because 
Christians use the same exact argument. The proof for the existence of God. Well, the ev evidence of design is also in the Quran. And since this was not the design put there by any human being, and we why, why not? We know the history of the Quran well enough to know that no human being engineered it to come out this way. We know the history of the Quran well enough. No, we know. Yeah, uh, he was saying, for example, that the Quran is a collection of pages and the way that Muslims were putting it together or the Sahaba were putting it together, they weren't intentional about putting it in a, in a very meticulous order. And he is implying here that this, this haphazardness was all part of Allah's plan to bring it together in the specific order that makes room for these so-called numeric miracles. And the thing is, some of these miracles that he doesn't cite in this video which aren't really miracles, only apply to one variant, not the others. So does that mean that the rest are not miraculous? Which which one is the Qur'an that Allah intended? Did Allah write it in seven dialects? Does Allah speak seven dialects? Why didn't Allah use languages instead of dialects? That would have been a lot more impressive, right? So let's get, let's get back to that last minute or last few seconds. We are seeing here that this is a, a revelation from the Almighty God. Okay, so that's it. What I wanted to say about the numeric miracles or so-called numeric miracles, what's funny about it is a lot of Muslims that I know personally who may not even be very religious, they would say, uh, no, that's that's a very silly point. Like, come on, this numbers and, and it's it's silly things like one time I had this discussion very early on as as Al Uh there there was someone, and this is why I don't answer DMs asking me to, brother, I'm just gonna explain this to you. It's very simple. I've heard it a million times. This person wanted to have a conversation and they said they're going to prove Islam is true. And I was never adversarial, but I thought, if you have something that I don't know, I would like to know about it. And then he started talking about how Surah Al-Hadid, which means metal or iron, if, if you want to consider it that, is, uh, is in the middle of the Qur'an. I can't remember the number exactly, how many surahs were in the Qur'an. If someone wants to to mention that, I, I completely forgot. But if you divide by two, then then you get that number, which was I think it was 58. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Qur'an was like 117 and it was number 58. Whatever it was, he, he was incorrect because the Qur'an doesn't start with index zero. There was something off about the math. 114, yes, thank you. Uh, 114, so that's half of that is... Am I correct? 157? 57, I guess. Anyhow, and the whole thing, the whole point of that is Surah Al-Hadid, the metal, is in the middle of the Qur'an. Therefore, and, and iron exists in the middle of the earth among so many other places. Therefore, that was a scientific and mathematical miracle at the same time, a combo, a double, uh, double combo right there. And that proves that Allah is behind this. And... Um, and and once I sh show uh, once I showed them that that wasn't actually mathematically accurate at all, let alone that's not really a point, they switched to something else, and then they got pissed off, and then they stopped talking. So the the thing about these miracles is, or so called miracles, if you knock one down and another one comes up, that means that this was never the proof. That's not why you believe. You're just finding reasons, not even good reasons. You're just finding things that look like they make sense, and then regurgitating them as evidence and Abdullah Samir he has this article I, I googled this minutes before the show I thought okay he's going to bring up numeric miracles I wonder I wonder what people say about this because I would call it the Texas sharpshooter fallacy which is the, the, the analogy here is you go out in the woods you shoot at a tree and then once you hit the tree with a bullet hole uh, or once you find the bullet hole, you just draw the circles around it, and there there you go. I hit it right in the middle. <laughs> and that's what's going on. You try to find patterns, or you try to find words, and then you draw a circle around it, a bunch of circles, and you say, look at how bullseye accurate this was. When you weren't searching for this, you found this, and then you use it now as some kind of evidence. Well, Abdullah Samir talks about a bunch more. I'm going to link the article. I'm not going to read it right now. I'm going to link it in the comments if you want to look at what he has to say about this with some specific examples. But aside from that, someone had mentioned here, um, was it Sharif? He had mentioned the birthday analogy 
or birthday. I'm misquoting him, but I put it on the screen. Yeah, birthday problem. And I, I heard of it briefly, and it was something along the lines of, if you bring, what was the number of people? If you bring a, a small number of people in a room, I think, was it 23 or so? The chances that two of them would have the same birthday is about 50% chance. So that's a high percentage. One would expect that the, the chances that two people would have the same birthday is, you know, it's one day out of 365. So what are the chances? It would be one in, was it one in 700 something? I'm, I'm doing the math possibly wrong, but it's, it's a lot lower than one in 365. Yet how come the chance is 50%? It's some mathematical thing or another. So when you're looking for these patterns, and when you find them, when you add up letters and you come up with the number 33 and then add this number and then subtract that, that's, that sounds like all of these conspiracy theories that, uh, that, you, that you hear from, from crazy people. And all those memes that a lot of us Muslims are very familiar with. Back in the day of um, emails, I remember the chain emails that would be sent. Say, subhanAllah, look, the, the fish on the side of the fish, it has Allah written on it. I mean, photoshopped on it usually, or if not, it's just some pattern, again, the, the sharpshooter fallacy. And it would be this kind of stuff that you just come across some coincidence or the other, or you would manufacture a coincidence. And yeah, uh, Abdullah Sharif is, is explaining it. The basic idea is that the function that governs the percentage does not scale linearly with sample size. Okay, that makes sense. So the the layman like myself would have expected that you would have to bring 700 something people to see two of them having the same birthday but that function does not scale that way so yeah <laughs> amber saying you're dating yourself with email chains as in i'm telling you that i'm very old yeah but i'm simultaneously very young and foolish apparently so you know people pick a lane and well one of the examples that abdullah samir cited let me pull it up on screen right now, because this this gives you an idea of the so-called miracles that that he's citing. And I don't want to misquote um, Shabir Ali, so I don't think I'm going to dedicate a video to that topic. But I will link the video in the comments so you could go watch what he's saying. And you do your own homework this time. Do a little bit of critical thinking without me telling you uh, what I think about it, because I've uh, I've gotten to a point where this kind of thing is just too silly to even consider and i'll mention one more thing in a second so abdullah samir put romeo and juliet uh, juliet in uh, in a word counter and he found time and old you know that they, they both coincide 33 times lord and god 31 times could that have been a coincidence look at how many coincidences there are there's no way shakespeare must have been in contact with god <laughs> And uh, th that's that's what some of this uh, numerical miracle stuff is. They add, they add up words or they count one word and then the opposite word or so-called opposite. Then they say they're both the same, but n not all variations or even if they're both the same, the same count. So what? Um, and one last thing. Again, it has to do with the language and it has to do with the opportunity and luxury to do all of this counting for, for absolutely no reason. 200 years ago, 300 years ago, say a sheikh came to you and said, I have proof that this book is from Allah. And you're non-Muslim, so you're like, who is Allah? And then you go through all of that and he tells you. And then he says, this word is mentioned 30-something times and this word is mentioned 60-something times and then add them together and, and he starts talking like that. And you would say, first of all, I don't speak this language. I don't believe that this word is mentioned that many times. Like, I don't I don't know, like, are you going to show me some symbols and I would trust that this symbol is repeated however many times? Am I going to sift through the Quran? How many coincidences does it take or, you know, how many uh, miracles does it take to convince someone? How, mu how much time will someone invest in all of this to, at the end, say, okay, your book has some numbers that match, so what? And if you if you try to, you'll find that in any book at all. So I have to be honest here. My, um, I don't know if I want to use the word respect, but the way that I view Shabir Ali's intellect has changed after watching that because I've always thought belief is not about intelligence. So intelligent people can believe in absurd things. And intelligent people, for example, as a different example, can fall for modern day cults 
one would expect that someone smart would not fall for an MLM, for example, or, or a get-rich scheme or a cult, but they do because there's a lot more factors involved than just simply intelligence. However, it gets to a point where, like I understand rationalizing belief in the superstition and so on, and it doesn't make someone less intelligent, but when you get to this level of believing, not only believing, but touting it as an educated person, uh, preaching Islam, touting numbers, adding together, I have to, his, um, my judgment of him has to take a hit a little bit. So yeah, that's that's really unfortunate because he seems to be one of the nicer ones out there. And it seems like he's intelligent in general, but that's uh, that's a bit of a, an anomaly right there. So that's that's what I think of the topic, and I'll leave the uh, the links in the description for you to do your own watching or reading. And I noticed one comment. I'll get to a couple more. I thought I'd be done in 30 minutes, but here we go. It's an hour. So this comment says, is one of the reasons why you don't criticize Christianity so much because it causes less threat and it proves that it can work out with modern society? Not exactly. So one main large reason why I, I don't speak about Christianity much is because I don't know much about Christianity and it doesn't interfere with my life or the life of people that I know very much. And there's kind of a handle on Christianity already. So there are a vocal, you know, anti-Christianity people out there, or even not necessarily anti-Christianity, but people who have left Christianity and they're not facing death threats and they're not ostracized like they have their own communities. And people are working on that. And obviously there's denominations that are more strict and more cult-like and more Islam-like in many ways, but it's it's far enough removed from me and it's small enough of a scale and already being handled by someone that my interference is not necessary. And I would need to study and look into things that as a Muslim came to me because I was a Muslim, uh, because I was learning about my religion and that's why I had interest in them or because I wanted to verify my religion. So what is the motivation for me and the and the time and energy to spend to do to go through all this trouble only to have a poorer grasp of what I'm criticizing compared to someone else, especially if I'm looking at the theology of it or the texts and so on. Um, so there's no really a point there. And when it comes to the societal impact, Christianity still does have an impact on things, but it's been diluted in so many ways and it has been kind of meddled with, I suppose, or not necessarily meddled with, whatever. It's been it's been modeled to work better with today's times, and it doesn't get in the way of non-believers' lives as much. And for that reason, I it's not much of an obstacle to me or many other people, so I'll let the people already kind of doing that to continue doing that. Uh, so I hope that answers that. And someone's saying there's a website called Miracles of Quran, which is filled with insane claims. And the thing about those is a Muslim could dismiss them and say, that's not why I believe. And that is uh, pretty silly. I can give you that even as a Muslim. But the mere fact that people are demonstrating that they already believe and then they're, they're rationalizing it should alarm you a little bit how many millions of people repeat the same thing when you still think that the conclusion is the same, Islam is true, but the way that they arrived at it is nonsensical, and you, as a as a rational Muslim, could see that it's nonsensical. That should make you think about the ways that you have arrived at your belief, and doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong, but it should get you thinking a little more, and it should worry you that the, the majority that made you feel so safe that if, if Islam isn't true, how come so many people believe in it, for example? That should be dismantled the moment that you see how people use the bizarrest rationalizations. And that applies to a, a bunch of other uh, religions as well. Amber says, I'm glad you're discussing intelligence. I had a weird superiority complex when I first decided I was an atheist and it's cringy looking back. That is um, that is a fault of a lot of people who uh, who leave religion and many other religions because you're not an ex-Muslim, right? You're, you're a ex, uh, ex-Christian, I believe. And I try to warn people against that. And I also, I just, I try to lead by example in a, in a sense. And I can't really police everybody. But yeah, I I didn't go through that much of a, no, I, I didn't go through that phase much, thankfully. I, I've always felt like I understand why 
they think the way that they do. It's just that once it starts harming themselves or other people, that's when I don't care whether it's intelligence involved or not. And sometimes the the strength of cognitive dissonance, it, it starts to affect your effective intelligence. You could be a very smart person, but if it if your brain is constrained by certain limits that you're too scared to cross or you're program not to cross it might not be a deficiency of the of uh, of how your brain works it's just a, a symptom of the religion that you're in or the the group that you're in so i empathize and i understand why that happens and it doesn't mean that i'm free of my own cognitive biases and, and cognitive dissonance and other topics and i i try to recognize it especially when doing something like this dissecting apologetics I don't want to be primed to disagree with every single thing that they say just because my conclusion is Islam is not the truth. I try to actually listen, does this make sense on its own? And I'm still waiting for instances where I can strongly, uh, confidently say, you know what, I had not thought about that. That is a good point. I need to reconsider. But if that if, if that was out there, very obviously I wouldn't be al Adin today. But, you know, I'm open to change. Let's see, a couple more comments here. <laughs> Christians seem to pull that that's the Old Testament stuff. Uh, I don't, yeah, that, that's one thing that I don't bother with. If if you follow the New Testament or whatever classification you want to give to it, I don't care as long as your, your, um, your current beliefs aren't harming anyone or yourself. So that's, that's all I care about really. And I wouldn't care to argue about the truthfulness of it because on a personal note, I think it's bizarre that you would have an Old Testament and then something new and, and so on. And it's not all, it's not demonstrated that, you know, God interfered and gave you the new thing or changed the meaning of anything. But I don't care about that kind of argument. Um, and that's why I don't have these kinds of arguments. Thank you, Buza Guy, for moderating and reminding everybody to please like, subscribe and do all that good stuff because it does help the channel. Um, and Kamar says, humility is a virtue. That's something religion teaches that ironically religious don't often employ, em, employ. And people will say that's a deficiency in, in religious people, not in the religion. But it depends on context, I would say. Because think about it. If Islam teaches you that you're, this is the truth, the absolute truth, and you don't even need to justify yourself and of course, a lot of people are going to be pompous about it and not, and that's not a place where Islam says be humble. It says be proud. So it really is context specific, I, I would say. Oh, oh my Lord, uh, that is very generous of you. Thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, I am, yeah, I'm out of words. That is, that is way too generous. Please make sure to donate somewhere else today as well. Uh, but thank you, my Lord. <laughs> thank you, my Lord. I didn't think about that. And um, th this is the last one I'll take, I suppose, from the Ben Shapiro-looking person, <laughs> warrior, the Jesus Christ follower. Uh, what are your thoughts on Jesus? So I don't know enough about Jesus from your sources to give you my thoughts on Jesus. Um, I, I hear a lot about uh, arguments about whether Jesus existed as a person or not, and I found those to be bizarre when people spend energy and time into it. And... Um, because it doesn't matter whether you prove there was a person called Jesus or whatever uh, the, the Hebrew equivalent of that would be, because it doesn't really prove that he was a, I don't know, God, son of God, part of God, whatever the Trinity says. And I, I see that a lot of the things that are attributed to him, well, he's not really a warlord, for example, so he he's different from Muhammad in certain ways. But the way that people confirm his prophethood and by people i mean christians it's again it's the same kind of things that muslims would tout about how people saw him do this or people saw him do that or if he wasn't a prophet how come he levitated or came back from the dead or or changed uh, whatever miracles it's all the same so yeah i see jesus as another historical character i don't know if he was a real person or not but i i'm pretty sure that's not god and um, it, it, he seems like kind of a, a martyr planted there by this, uh, this God character. If God were real, 
he made Jesus to take the brunt of the the blame or the guilt off of your shoulders, the whole thing doesn't really add up for me. But again, I haven't read into this enough. Uh, it, and it's proof that one doesn't really need to look too deeply into every religion to realize that, you know, they, they don't believe in the concept itself. Anyway, uh, thank you everybody for joining today. I really appreciate it. And that is the one hour mark. Damn it. Damn it. I wanted to make it right under one hour. So we're just going to go over an hour now. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining everybody. And I'll see you next time. Think critically and think for yourself. Bye-bye. Log off quickly enough. Bye.